Today's video is sponsored by Bill and Melinda Gates. Milestones are an important part of life, a way to look both back over where we've been and forward to where we're going. 2019 just got left behind us and with it an entire decade. It was a good year, followed a good decade for me personally. I started new channels, you probably saw those, saw things grow, and indeed saw some things get left behind as life draws its focus to other areas, like uh, my wife and I having our first child, which was, uh, that was quite something. People often ask me why I do so many things, why has Simon got another channel, why do I launch projects seemingly every other month? Well, I believe that you get one shot at life, you get one chance to swing for the fences, and I'd be silly to waste this opportunity that I've been given, so I kind of work all the time just to make the most of it. But there are people out there who make all of what I'm doing look pretty damn small. People like Bill and Melinda Gates, who in their annual letter share their reflections on some of the big risks that they've taken in global health and education over the last two decades of their foundation. Because with big risks, you get big rewards. And with that in mind, today's video is themed all around the topic of climate change. Please enjoy. Throughout most of history, the majority view was that the Earth's general climate had remained largely unchanged since the beginning, outside of things like religious-based ideas of mass flooding and things like that. Around the early 19th century, however, the matter began to be revisited. Kicking it off in the 1830s, Swiss scientist Louis Agassiz published his groundbreaking work on glaciers, proving that the climate used to be very different. With ideas like this gradually gaining steam, scientists the world over started considering what could have possibly caused such a drastic change on a planetary scale. It turns out the seeds of the solution were already known. For example, going back about a decade before Agassiz's publication in 1824, Joseph Fourier of mathematical formula fame noted that the Earth was warmer than it should be strictly by the solar radiation reaching Earth, hypothesizing that something in the atmosphere must be trapping energy radiating from the surface. A couple of decades later, physicist and inventor Eunice Newton Foote began attempting to quantify in a scientifically rigorous fashion how sunlight warmed various gases differently. So what did she find? Most pertinent to the topic at hand is that the more moisture in the air, the greater heating effect observed, and that the highest effect of the sun's rays I have found to be in carbonic acid gas, carbon dioxide. An atmosphere of that gas would give to our Earth a high temperature. And if at one period of its history the air had mixed with it a larger proportion than at present, an increased temperature from its own action must have necessarily resulted. In 1863, Irish scientist John Tyndall would much more famously concur, explaining in a nutshell how this greenhouse effect actually worked. The solar heat possesses the power of crossing an atmosphere, but when the heat is absorbed by the planet, it is so changed in quality that the rays emanating from the planet can cannot get with the same freedom back to space. Thus, the atmosphere admits the entrance of the solar heat but checks its exit, and the result is a tendency to accumulate heat at the surface of the planet. Slightly more progress was made thanks to Swiss scientist and Nobel Prize winner Svante Arrhenius, who in 1896, in his own attempt to explain past climate change, published a paper with quite extensive calculations that indicated carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, despite being quite low, could likely be a culprit. That said, few people paid any attention to this at the time, with those who would research the matter in the decades following ultimately concluding, to quote Sir George Clark Simpson, then director of the British Meteorological Office in 1929, it is now generally accepted that variations in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, even if they do occur, can have no appreciable effect on the climate. So who would finally convince the experts that they were wrong if not a Nobel Prize winner? Well, it turns out it was just a random guy, Guy Callender to be precise, who was collecting data as a bit of a hobby on the side from his day job as a steam engine engineer. Born on February the 9th, 1898, Guy was the son of one of the leading scientific minds of the 19th century, physicist Hugh Callender. Thanks to Guy's father's extreme success using his academic talents towards not just advancing science but inventing things that sold well, Guy grew up in a 22-room mansion and was given, along with his siblings, an extensively equipped laboratory, converted, ironically enough, given what Calendar would go on to be remembered for today, a greenhouse. 
Of course, not all things went swimmingly in his early days as a budding researcher, in part owing to one of his brothers accidentally blowing up the children's laboratory when he was attempting to make TNT. Also, at one point, that same brother accidentally blinded Guy in his left eye. Thankfully, Guy retained the use of his other eye, which we like to think he nicknamed Old Reliable. When he wasn't getting himself blinded or tinkering away in what was apparently the most badass kids' lab of all time, after attending Durston House School, Guy apprenticed under his father during World War I, working for the Air Ministry in various research and advancements for the war effort, such as developing an X-ray system for use in analyzing engine blocks to make sure they were free of defect. Besides that, he also received a degree in mechanics and mathematics from Imperial College, but after that, he abandoned any further formal education. Among other hobbies on the side, he also began collecting weather data. As to why, well, Calendar simply noted, as man is now changing the composition of the atmosphere at a rate which must be very exceptional on the geological timescale, it is natural to seek for the probable effects of such a change. So, in short, he was just curious. As he began collecting the data, first, as others had observed, he noticed the global temperature had increased over the last half century or so. He thus began to consider all the various factors that could cause it, including properties of gases in the atmosphere, average sunlight in different regions, ocean currents, etc., etc., attempting to account for every possible variable he could, and then figuring out which elements were causing the change and how. Towards this end, he corresponded with scientists and researchers the world over, collecting massive amounts of data from a couple of hundred weather stations and performing literally tens of thousands of calculations by hand in his spare time. By 1937, he was ready to publish his findings. As to what he found, the data showed that carbon dioxide density in the atmosphere had risen from about 274 to 292 parts per million in the late 19th century to just over 300 parts per million in the late 1930s. For reference, it currently stands at just over 400 parts per million today. Via calculating the estimated amount of carbon dioxide humans were releasing into the atmosphere each year, and estimating how much various mechanisms in the ocean and the like could absorb this, he also found that the rise could be directly attributed to the net increase from man-made activities. On top of that, when crunching the numbers on the extra infrared absorption this would result in, among other factors to consider, it directly correlated to the observed global temperature increase in the half century before his paper was written. Unfortunately for him, and the thousands of hours of his spare time he put into this, nobody cared. In fact, when he submitted his paper, The Artificial Production of Carbon Dioxide and Its Influence on Temperature, for publication on May the 19th, 1937, nobody even bothered to look at it until February the 16th, 1938, almost a year later. Shortly thereafter, in April of 1938, it was published to little fanfare, although he was able to present his research to six climate scientists at the Royal Meteorological Society. Party. They weren't impressed, or more aptly, given the minutes recorded of the discourse after his presentation, which are quite a fascinating read, including Calendar's responses to objections, they were impressed with the amount of effort he clearly put in, as well as the extremely professional way in which he presented the data. They merely thought little of that data, and thus the conclusions that he came to. The aforementioned Sir Simpson, who was one of the panel members, also explicitly noted Calendar was a non-meteorologist. In essence, he didn't know enough to know what he was talking about, and all his data showed was a mere coincidence. Correlation does not equal causation. And more to the point, they question the accuracy of Calendar's carbon dioxide and temperature measurements in the first place, despite the extreme effort Calendar explicitly went to to reduce the noise in the data and account for potential error bars. And if you're curious just how accurate he was, given our more enlightened vantage point and snazzy supercomputers able to crunch the numbers far more effectively and with massively greater and more accurate data sets, modern estimates from the Carbon Dioxide Information Analysis Center indicate that from 1887 to 1937, the net amount of carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere from mankind's activities was about 140,000 million tons. Calendar, in contrast, sat in his little office in England, compiling data from across the globe, using it to make estimates of absorption and emissions, all the while crunching the numbers by hand. His result? 150,000 million tons. 
Presumably, if Calendar was still alive today, the revelation of the CDIAC's number in comparison with his would have resulted in one of the most delayed mic drops in scientific history. Nevertheless, Calendar's work was largely dismissed, and the consensus remains that even if he was correct on his measurements of carbon dioxide and the like, this still was insufficient to cause any measurable change in global temperatures. Something else must have been the real cause if such a change was occurring. Undeterred, Calendar, with no outside funding or support, soldiered on. Quite literally, as not long after he joins the war effort, working for the British military during World War II, doing things like helping design a fog dispersal system to be implemented in aerodromes in Britain. Called Fido, the system worked by warming up the air around the airstrips using rows of pipes that more or less amounted to giant burners. Key in this system was that it had to use as little fuel as possible to create the desired result and make sure that the whole thing didn't create any smoke. To accomplish both of these things, Calendar was tasked with developing the trench burners, among other elements. While you might surely think that such a system couldn't work on the scale they needed it to, when the first tests were conducted, they were a rousing success. After the FIDO system was lit, mere moments later, the fog dissipated around the aerodrome, allowing Allied planes to come in and land safely. Once switched back off, the protective fog quickly enveloped the aerodrome as the ambient temperatures and the dew point once again met, once again keeping the sight from the prying eyes of enemy bombers. When Calendar wasn't working on systems like this for the war effort, on the side, he continued his research. Research. Over the next couple of decades of his life, until his death in 1964, he also continued to publish papers and articles about the issue with little fanfare and significant resistance from those scientists who were reading his work. As to why no one would accept what the data was saying, Calendar had his own ideas on that too, which proved to be every bit as accurate among climate change skeptics today as then. He postulated, a. The idea of a single, easily explained factor causing worldwide climactic change seems impossible to those familiar with the complexity of the forces on which any and every climate depends. B. The idea that man's actions could influence so vast a complex system is very repugnant to some. C. The meteorological authorities of the past have pronounced against it, mainly on the basis of faulty observations of water vapor absorption, but also because they had not studied the problem to anything like the extent required to pronounce on it. D. Last but not least, they did not think of it themselves. He would later sum up how easy it is to criticize and how difficult to produce constructive theories of climate change. All that said, while few were listening, few was not none. One such individual was Charles Keeling, who, in 1958, was able to use far more accurate measurement equipment, partially of Keeling's own design, to start gathering data at the Mauna Loa Observatory. The result was groundbreaking, and finally got scientists the world over paying attention. After all, these results, while more or less correlating with Calendar's own data, came from a PhD and left little room for debate given the known accuracy of the instruments used. In what would be called the Keeling Curve, the graph, besides accurately charting the fluctuation of atmospheric carbon dioxide levels throughout the seasons, showed a steady increase year over year that could be directly attributed to mankind's activities. From here, as the matter became more and more studied, the effects of added methane in the atmosphere also began to become just as concerning, primarily thanks to its potency as a greenhouse gas. And while you might comedically think methane from the rising human population's flatulence might be a culprit, it turns out, contrary to popular belief, only about one-third of humans have measurably significant amounts of methane in their rear valves' gaseous expulsions, and even for that subgroup, generally only when eating a lot of fiber, and even then, only comprising about 3.6% methane. It turns out the real problem is the gas from another creature, cows, with livestock the largest source of methane gas emissions worldwide, contributing over 28% of those total emissions. Wetlands, leaks from oil refineries and drills and landfills also significantly contribute methane to the atmosphere. Atmosphere. It's commonly stated from this that cow farts are the burning problem, but this isn't actually correct. According to researchers at New Zealand's Crown Research Institute, AG Research, up to 95% of the offending emissions come from the cow's mouth rather than its behind, which is too bad for the darkly hilarious notion of cow farts someday significantly contributing to the demise of humanity should the extreme worst case ever happen. Sort of Bessie's revenge for, you know, all of the milking and slaughter which combines to give us delicious mouth watering cheeseburgers. To put the effects of all of this burping in perspective, as noted in the 2020 edition of the always interesting Bill and Melinda Gates annual letter, 
If the cat all the world over we use for our absolutely essential and god-given hamburgers and cheddar were a nation of their own and we calibrated the effect of the methane to an equivalent effect by a given amount of carbon dioxide, cattle would slot just behind number two on the list of worst greenhouse gas emitters, the United States. For those wondering who's number one, it's China. In any event, going back to Keeling's research, after he published his data, climate scientists and a handful of world leaders finally started paying attention. The problem was, in general, the wider public wasn't really. This all culminated in NASA's James E. Hansen's famous 1988 speech to the U.S. Senate at the behest of Colorado Senator Tim Wirth. To make the presentation as effective as possible, it was purposefully planned during one of the hottest periods of the year in what was then one of the hottest summers on record. To drive the point home, Senator Wirth also had the air conditioning turned off during Hansen's testimony. All combined with record temperatures, droughts, and abnormal weather patterns the world over, the public started listening too. Naturally, with the public en masse now more aware of the problem and a bit panicky, efforts on both sides were almost immediately put into place to both lobby the governments of the world to help facilitate a solution, as well as on the other side, various major industries that could be negatively impacted in the immediate by such efforts, throwing a whole lot more money at convincing everyone there was no problem at all and that everything is totally fine. Nothing to see here, just move along. And indeed, in their defense, the data sets and models of the era did allow for reasonable doubt on what the ultimate effect of all of this would be, something still debated today even with far better models and a better idea of what temperature changes are likely to occur. Of course, in the process of all of this, the matter became politicized, a surefire way to ensure few among the public or politicians care about what the actual data says or the consensus of the experts in the field, and rather just whether the general idea was supported or not by the political party they, or in some cases, their parents subscribed to. This all leads us to the hot mess we have today, with effectively a universal consensus among climate scientists the world over that climate change is happening. Nearly as strong of a consensus that humans are the primary driver of that change, and a slightly lesser consensus on what the results of all of this will be. Everything from an increase in temperatures over the next century sufficient to cause cascading and possibly unstoppable warming thanks to massive amounts of further greenhouse gases being released as the polar regions melt, to more mild estimates of a a couple of degree increase. On this latter point, this is still a concern as it will result in obscene amounts of money needed to maintain coastal cities, as well as resulting in millions in poorer regions of the world dying as a result, but at least with humanity otherwise fine in the grand scheme of things, so long as steps are taken in the interim to make sure the problem doesn't get worse. Okay, so what's to be done? On the simpler side of things, some have suggested dumping a few million tons of sulfur dioxide annually high in the atmosphere to more or less counter the effects of the additional carbon dioxide and methane added. At the cost of only in the billions for such a program, this is far less than is already being spent to counter the current effects of climate change on coastal cities. Of course, the downside of things like that are rather unhealthy air pollution, and once started, it could potentially be catastrophic to just stop the program all at once, depending on how long it had been going on. Thus, few find a method such as this a viable solution. It's a blanket over the dried cat vomit on your couch. Sure, you can now use the couch as before without fixing anything and not getting any vomit on you, but remove the blanket and the vomit is still there. Nobody wants a vomit-covered couch. Others suggest a more environmentally friendly approach that actually adds usable land to the planet, for instance, covering the Sahara, among many other deserts, with forests. While this might seem an impossibility, it turns out this very thing has been done on a much smaller scale in places like the very doorstep of the Sahara, the region known as the Sahel. For example, after a series of droughts that left tens of thousands dead, efforts were made in Burkina Faso to try and figure out a way to restore the soil, including via low-tech, dirt-cheap means. One extremely effective method was placing long lines of small stones which allowed water to remain in the hard cracked soil long enough for grass seeds to sprout. This in turn led to the area around this to retain more water and be cooled, which in turn spread until in only a handful of years fields where this was done were restored and could once again be farmed. Additional efforts to accelerate the process included digging thousands of shallow holes and placing manure and tree seeds inside. This also all encouraged termites to set up shop, with these termites in turn digging tiny little trenches through the soil to help water get absorbed instead of being washed away. The combination of this resulted in the trees and subsequent vegetation thriving, with, for example, one man, Jacoba Swadogo, managing to turn 50 acres of bare desert he owned into a giant private forest in relatively short order. Among other trees in his little forest, 
included the Dratrofa curcus. With a mere 50 acres of these extremely drought-resistant trees capable of offsetting the current carbon footprint of over 500 Americans per year. On a much grander scale, using similar techniques, the populace of Niger managed to salvage a whopping 40,000 square miles of land in this way. For reference here, there are 15 states in the United States that are smaller than that land area. Of course, doing this in these regions bordering a desert is one thing, doing it in regions like the Sahara itself and on that kind of scale, for reference the Sahara is 3.5 million square miles, is rather another. And while this is a significantly nicer blanket on the cat vomit, the underlying problem would still be there. In the end, solutions such as this are often seen as more appealing as they require no one to change the way that we actually do anything and really outsource the actual work to someone else. Which on that note, if anyone would like to come clear up my dried cat vomit, go right ahead. As to fixing the underlying problem, it turns out that's incredibly complex too, touching on basically every single facet of human life. For example, direct energy production to power our lives only accounts for about 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions that humans are responsible. So even if 100% of this type of energy we produce was switched to zero emission solutions, there's still the big old elephant in the room of the other 75%, comprising such things as manufacturing steel, cement and plastics, maintenance of large buildings, which are kind of essential to humans, human in, etc. And well, you can take our cheeseburgers from our cold, dead hands. There are no easy or cheap solutions, aside from somewhat undesirable ones like massively polluting the atmosphere in a cooling way, thereby simultaneously fixing one problem by creating a new one. It's a complex problem that requires complex and very diverse and numerous solutions implemented across the globe and countless industries, all combining to simultaneously reduce additional greenhouse gas emissions find ways to remove the rest, and at the same time help those most affected by the inevitable changes we can't prevent in the meantime. As to this group, as Bill Gates aptly points out in the aforementioned annual letter, the cruel irony is that the world's poorest people who contribute the least to climate change will suffer the worst. In the end, while the problem is complex, humans are rather good at solving problems, especially when cheeseburgers are on the line. And in the last decade particularly, we finally started admitting en masse that we have a cheeseburger and climate change problem, which is always the first step to finding a solution. As Mr. Gates sums up in the aforementioned annual letter, tackling climate change is going to demand historic levels of global cooperation, unprecedented amounts of innovation in nearly every sector of the economy, widespread deployment of today's clean energy solutions, and a concerted effort to work with the people who are most vulnerable to a warmer world. This is one of the most difficult challenges the world has ever taken on, but I believe we can avoid a climate catastrophe if we take steps now to reduce emissions and find ways to adapt to a warmer world. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Brand new videos just like this every day of the week. And as always, thank you for watching.